how do you get really good at math and what's the fastest way to do it? So I used to hang out on this message board a long time ago, it was these forums on the internet. And there was this guy on there, he had a PhD and he was always giving recommendations to people. People were asking for advice and he was like giving them advice. And I'd read all the posts, oh, there he is, what's he gotta say, you know? And he had really bad, um, <laughs> really bad grammar and stuff, but he had a PhD, he's retired now. And he always talked about reading the masters, reading, you know, the best books. And that, that is one way, but it really is more than that. It's about learning from the best. So if you're taking a class, whether it be, you know, face-to-face -face or maybe it's an online class, one way to get really, really good at math is to try to learn from the best. And what I mean by that is try to get the best books. And this, this is tough, right? Because people have different opinions about books. Try to watch the best lectures. So we have YouTube, right? You can go on the internet and you can find lectures. Try to find the ones that make sense to you. And everyone is different. So what's a good lecture to someone might not be a good lecture to you. For example, I was taking a class long ago, uh, Calculus 3, and everyone loved the teacher, right? I mean, everyone loved that class. Uh, you know, I got an A, but everyone was really into the class. I was not. <laughs> so I had a really hard time understanding what was going on in class. And I read the book and I taught myself. I used the book by Stuart. I remember reading, you know, all the stuff on the cross product. I taught myself the cross product from the book. I mean, really, really hard, hard stuff, right? So avoid that right? Learn from the best. Go online, find a video of someone teaching you the cross product or whatever you're trying to learn. Because if you find the best sources to learn, you will learn faster. I mean, there's nothing like having a good teacher. You know, if I look back and I think about all the teachers I've had, I've had some that are okay and some, you know, it's just not, not great, but I've had some that are just amazing, right? I've had some really, really good teachers. And those are the teachers, I think, that really, really changed how much I learned and how I feel about math. I mean, you really get a really good appreciation when when you hear someone explain math well. I mean, there's nothing like listening to a really good professor and just absorbing that information. It's just amazing. So learn from the best. So if you're having a hard time reading your math book or you're having a hard time, you know, um, you know, with your professor because the lectures are just not for you, go online, right, and, and do some research and find other lectures. Good luck. Hi everyone, in this problem we have a polynomial function and we have a three-part question. So part A wants us to find the rational zeros, part B wants us to find a zero, I guess by testing the rational zeros, and then part C wants us to find the rest using our previous answers. So let's go ahead and follow the directions and just go through it uh, fairly easily. So we're going to start by looking at the possible rational roots or the possible rational zeros. So to do that, we look at the factors of the last one. So factors of negative 4. And then you divide by the factors of this number here. It's always the last one over the first one. So factors of negative 4 over the factors of 1. And so the factors of uh, 4 are 1, 2, and 4, or factors of negative 4 are 1, 2, and 4. And we always have to put a plus or minus. So plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, and plus or minus 4 over the factors of 1, which is just plus or minus 1. Again, it's always the last one over the first one, the constant term over the leading coefficient. And don't forget the plus or minus. So 1 over 1 is 1, so we have plus or minus 1. 2 over 1 is 2. 4 over 1 is 4. So this is the answer to part A. These are the possible rational zeros. Part B wants us to find a zero. So I think they want us to use this and synthetic division. So let's start by checking 1. So let's check 1. I'm going to show you how to do this. So to check if 1 is a zero, what you do is you put a 1 here like this. And then you write down the coefficients of your polynomial. So 1, 1, negative 4, negative 4. And then you use synthetic division, okay? So you just pick one and then see if it works. How do you know if it works? We're gonna go through this whole process and if we get zero as a remainder, then we know this is one of the answers. If we don't get zero, then we're just gonna pick a different number. So it's kind of like a trial and error type thing. You just pick one of these, write it down, write down your coefficients, and then try to use synthetic division. Okay, 
So in synthetic division, we wrote down the 1 and we wrote down the coefficients, 1, 1, negative 4, negative 4. And the first step is to just bring this one down, so 1. Then you perform the multiplication. 1 times 1 is 1. Then you add. 1 plus 1 is 2. Then 2 times 1 is 2. Then you add, so you get negative 2. Negative 2 times 1 is negative 2. We add, we get negative 6. No, it's no good, right? We don't want that. <laughs> it's bad. Terrible. We want to get 0, so let's try... Let's try a different number. Let's try negative 1. So let's check. Right, you want to keep doing this until you, get, until you get 0 as a remainder. So I'll put the negative 1 here. Keep our coefficients. 1, 1, negative 4, negative 4. Over. Same thing. Bring down the 1. 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. We add, we get 0. 0 times negative 1 is 0. We add, we get negative 4. Negative 4 times negative 1 is 4. We add, we get 0. At this point, we can rejoice because the remainder is 0, and this means that x equals negative 1 is a 0. So you keep doing it until you get uh, 0 as a remainder, and that's how you know that this is one of your answers. So that's one of our answers. This is the answer to part B. For part C, all we have to do is use this. Okay. So we started with, let's go back to the beginning, a cubic function. So it's always going to be one less now. So now it's quadratic, so it's two. So basically you take this, and these are your coefficients. So it's one times x squared, see, plus zero x minus four. So you just take this and then just set it equal to zero every time, okay? Always. Just it's always one less. So if that was a five up there, this would be a four. So here we have x squared minus four equal to zero. This is actually the difference of squares. So this is x minus 2, x plus 2, and this is equal to 0. So we get two possible answers, 2 and negative 2. And those are the other zeros. So the three zeros of this function are negative 1, negative 2, and 2. Those are the zeros of this function. Now, I'm pretty sure this is like the easiest possible example. So we could have done this another way. I'm pretty sure we could have factored out an x squared here. I've written this as x plus 1, and then pull out a 4 here, and write this as x plus 1, and watch this. Now you can pull out an x plus 1, x plus 1, and then we have x squared minus 4. And this is x plus 1. The difference of squares is x minus 2, x plus 2. So you can factor this entire polynomial set it equal to zero, and we get all of the answers in like 45 seconds. And we save all of this work. So why did I do it this way? Did I not notice? No, no, I did. As soon as I wrote the problem down, I thought, ah, oh, maybe I should do a different one, because this one's too easy. Uh, but most of the time, you can't do this. Like in 99% of the time, like it won't work. So if you're taking a class or something, and whoops, and this is the question, you're probably not going to be able to do it this way. You'll have to go through the process and do it this way. In any case, I hope this video has been helpful to someone out there in the world. Good luck to you.